Let's take our Bibles once again and turn to John's Gospel, chapter 2. My text is from verse 1 through 11, and I've entitled this, A Wedding to Remember. All of us have perhaps attended weddings, and if you're married, probably the one wedding to remember is your own. And yet here we have our Lord Jesus Christ attending a particular wedding which has a lesson for us as far as the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why I say this is a wedding to remember. The scripture speaks of the first marriage that took place, and that was back in Genesis, where the Lord put Adam to sleep and took out of his side a bride for Adam and brought her to him. And that's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as the husband of his church and that his coming into this world was to redeem unto himself and unite unto himself that people that God the Father had given him. Because in the biblical sense, of weddings, it was the father that chose the bride for the son, and when they were brought together, they were united together as one. And we know that this is what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished in his coming to this earth and working out that perfect righteousness, the satisfaction of his father that God might be just and declare righteous that people that had given to his son. And so there's a lot of significance even in a wedding. Now here in John chapter two, what I find interesting, it was here in Cana. And remember Nathaniel was from Cana. So when you see and at the beginning of verse one, it's really a continuation of what the Lord had been teaching Nathaniel, and not only Nathaniel, but all those that were his disciples as to who he is. And this is really the first of the miracles that our Lord Jesus Christ did. It says in the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So here our Lord now had his baptism, which was his anointing as that high priest who would come to save his people. See, every one of these events, it has significance as far as the person work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, when you consider, well, what would be his first miracle? What was the purpose of these miracles? Well, just like any of the miracles described in Scripture, they have as their purpose to declare the glory and the power and honor of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are seven different miracles that John speaks of in his epistle. There are more than that that our Lord performed. In fact, John wrote, there are many other things that Christ did and said that, that cannot be written, and he supposed that where everything written, the, the world couldn't contain the books. So what we have here is the inspired word of God, selective, yes, but for this one purpose, to declare the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in John chapter two, my text verses one through 11, we have at this wedding, Christ turning water into wine. Now, before we get too far along here, when you think of water and wine, both depict the Lord Jesus Christ. Water being a type of his life, he's the water of life, and wine depicting his death. You can't escape this, and this is part of the problem because people get caught up reading this, oh, what a miracle it was, and how marvelous, and how did he do that? and miss completely the point. 
Every miracle, every parable, every proverb, every type, every picture, every <clears throat> promise, every prophecy of Scripture, if we miss Christ, we miss it. So this isn't just to show Christ's power when he took this water and turned it into wine, but a demonstration of his person and his work and what it typifies. We're going to look at that. Bob read it already in 1 John 5, where it spoke of him coming not just in water, but in blood. Water and the blood. That's what the wine typifies. So put a bookmark there and we'll come back to it. In John chapter 4, these are the, there were seven miracles that the Lord directed John to write of concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 4, in verses 46 to 54, that's the next miracle that we're going to see. And that has to do with the healing of the nobleman's son. What does that speak of Christ other than him being the healer and the one who has life? In John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, that's the third miracle. There's the healing at the pool of Bethsaida. And here is this invalid that lay by that pool. According to tradition, he was waiting for the angel to come down and stir the waters. It's a picture of men's thinking and superstitions that somehow there's life outside of Christ. And while he sat there or laid there waiting in vain, along comes the Lord Jesus Christ and healed him. That's where life is. It's in the person work of Lord Jesus Christ. And John chapter 6 is the fourth time that we find a miracle in the Gospel of John, and that was feeding the 5,000. Again, a picture of the bread of life, Christ being that bread. In John chapter 6 and verses 15 to 21, that would be the fifth. That's Jesus walking on the water. In all of these, we see Christ set forth as creator, who can walk on the water but him that created it, who can still the wind and the waves but him that created it. Who can take water here in John chapter 2 and turn it into wine but the creator? And then we see him also as sovereign in his providence. And every one of these, Christ has set forth. He's the governor. He's the ruler. All things are according to his word. So when he spoke the word, the man was healed at the pool of Bethsaida. When he spoke the word, the 5,000 were fed. When he spoke the word, he walked on that water and commanded his disciples to come to him as he's the word. But he's sovereign as creator, sovereign as in his providence, sovereign in his redemption. We cannot read and study this miracle in John chapter 2 without seeing him as that sovereign. It particularly struck me, and I'm getting ahead of the story here a little bit, when it says here that in verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, what? And manifested forth his glory. His glory is creator. His glory is the governor, the ruler, the providence in his time. His glory as the redeemer. But he's sovereign even in judgment because notice here in verse 11, even though this miracle was done in front of those that were present at this wedding, it doesn't speak of the master of the wedding ever believing on Christ or any of the others in attendance. But it says here, and his disciples believed on him. Everything that's done and written in this word is for that particular people for whom he came. This wasn't just to wow the crowd, but that through this, and I imagine his disciples going away from this wedding, pondering what they had just seen and observed and how the spirit of the Lord would have begun to teach them, just like the Lord said to Nathaniel, you believe these things that I've told you, greater things than these you will see. And so if we even studying this, First miracle, miracles are enabled by his spirit to see that this is all about the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is. 
I'll tell you, you can read some commentaries, and there's some wild interpretations out there about what this has to do, but it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I said, when you think of water, think of Christ. When you think of the wine, think of Christ. Water, Christ, who is the giver of life, and wine, by his death, that life is given. But two other miracles that John speaks of in John chapter 9. I love that chapter, the healing of the blind man. The man born blind, that's all of us. And yet it pleased the Lord to give him sight and draw him to himself. And then in John 11, again, is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. As I said, those are seven miracles. Seven in scripture is a type of perfection. It's a type of completeness. And I believe if there were no other miracles that were recorded in scripture, John was led specifically to write of those seven miracles for that one purpose. What more do you need to hear and know of the Lord Jesus Christ other than what's revealed in by and through those miracles that he did? And so as we study this, this is not just about a miracle, but this is, as it says there in verse 11 of John chapter 2, this beginning of miracles. Another way of seeing that, it's not just that this was the first of many, but the word beginning there being the miracle of miracles. That if we are not enabled to see anything else through the other miracles that the Lord said and did, everything that we need to know of the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed right here. And that's why I call this a wedding to remember. Because in it and through what we see here is the very revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it says, coming back to my text in John chapter 2, that it was the third day. This would have been the third day after the Lord had been pleased to reveal himself to Nathaniel and spoke thereof. And again, Nathaniel being from Cana, this would have been of significance and importance even to him because these were folk he knew. This is where he was born. This is where he was raised. And now it was here in this insignificant place. Notice this miracle didn't take place down there in Jerusalem. It was in this out of way place called Cana that the Lord was pleased to manifest himself at this time. Of course, there's a lot of significance even in the third day. You can't help but think about the third day when Christ rose again, because everything here is a picture of life. And so you talk about miracle of miracles, even in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, was, he died, he was buried, and rose again the third day. Picture of life, of new beginnings. When it says there, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. But well, there was a new beginning in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his rising again. And through that, the work being accomplished for the salvation of his people, his church, that's all manifest and depicted here. A lot of people want to know, well, who wasn't getting married here? And there's some wild, far-out views. Some say that this was... Uh, wedding that John himself, this was John's wedding, whereby the Lord was pleased to attend it with his presence. There's no proof in scripture that that was John specifically. An even worse interpretation that you'll find out there was that this wedding was none other than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. How he would have taken to himself a bride and been married to her physically. And again, nothing of that is spoken of in Scripture. There is a bride that the Father has given to his Son, but it's a spiritual bride. It's not any one particular woman as purported out there that somehow he took to himself a physical woman and, and married her. No, he had a bride. From all eternity, God purposed that that bride should be his and that he should come and pay the sin debt. That's his people. That comprises every elect sinner from the beginning of time all the way to the end of time who 
And this one time and one place through his death, he accomplished everything necessary that that bride might be joined unto him. It's a spiritual bride. And we await, as the scriptures declare, the, the, the wedding, the bride, the marriage feast of the Lamb, when all those from all time that the Lord has paid their sin debt will be forever joined unto him. So we dare not speculate here. It was clearly somebody from Cana that knew our Lord Jesus Christ and his family and therefore summoned him or asked him if he would come to the wedding. And it says that the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Here's where we see that the Lord puts it in the hearts of his people to, to call out to the Lord and, and the Lord as he directs joins himself unto those whom he will. He's not directed by men or their will or their ways, but here it was out of mercy that we see the Lord Jesus attending this wedding and, and being there. I stop and think about how it is that God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, should ever join himself unto such sinners as we are. That's a grace that he would bless us with his presence. Even as he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. When we begin our times of worship together and ask the Lord's presence, it's not like he's absent and now we've got to beg him to come and be here. He's here. But we acknowledge our need of him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, when it says both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage, there was here in this marriage, and we don't know exactly again who it was specifically, people speculate, but we know and can say this, that it was certainly one or ones, if you consider the husband and the wife, upon whom God had put his favor, Christ already had put his favor. And therefore, they desired that he bless them with his presence, even as we do as we meet week in and week out. But now in verse 3, we see the problem. It says, and when they wanted wine, and yes, this is wine. I've read all kinds of commentaries where people try to make it into grape juice. And they are teetotalers in the sense of, oh, well, the Lord would never have anything to do with making wine. Wine was a part of the culture. Now, nowhere in Scripture does it encourage drunkenness. In fact, the Scriptures warn against looking upon the wine when it is red. And there are many people that abuse wine. But the sin is not in the bottle, it's in the heart. Used as the Lord directs, he's the one that causes the grapes to grow, and he's the one that causes those grapes to be processed and fermented, and used as part of the culture or the eating. Remember they accused Christ himself of being a wine bibber, and yet he was never drunk, but he did eat with publicans and sinners. And so many are appalled, or, and this shows how people, to protect their own views of Scripture, will pervert it. But the word wine here is that word, when they wanted wine. This is a wedding party. This is a wedding feast. It was customary to drink wine with the meal as part of the festivity. But they lacked wine. So here again, it shows that man, whatever he puts his hand to, is going to come up wanting. Here were all these guests that had been here, and they were gathered, and suddenly the steward becomes concerned because there were more people than what the wine would last. And so the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Now, 
the, the mother of Jesus had never seen a miracle done yet by this one through whom this son had come. And you can imagine in a natural sense, knowing that this one given to her through her womb from a virgin, he came forth, knowing the prophecies that were foretold her concerning this one, this was not just any son. This was the very son of God. And so such was the persuasion that the Lord had given Mary concerning this son, different from the other sons that she was given through Joseph, that she looked to her son and say to him, they have no wine. But here now, we see where the Lord himself will not be pushed. He will not be, as some people think, well, if you just pray enough, then he's going to act. Here's where our Lord made known to Mary that though she was blessed among women, and how he responded to her here in verse 4 is in no way our Lord putting her down. When it says here, Jesus saith unto her, woman. Some would say, well, that wasn't a very nice way to talk about her. Some would say he should have said mother. But here is where our Lord, even by addressing her as a woman, it was not a, a term of derision toward her, but a reminder. It's like the scriptures say, she was to be blessed among women. And so he's speaking to her here, even as when he was a child at the age of 12, Joseph and Mary came looking for him. And he said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? But even here, speaking of her as a woman, it's a reminder of who she is, not blessed above women, but among women. When he was at the cross, he used that same term with regard to John saying to him that this woman, he was to care for. So he had a care and a love for her as an earthly mother is concerned, but she needed that reminder at the same time that he's not the son of Mary, but he's the very son of God. And so even though there was this physical Relationship, In other words, God purposed that he should come through her womb. Yet is a reminder that he was not at her beck and call. That anything he did, he did according to the will of his father, which was in heaven. And that's why he said to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? There again, he's not in any way denouncing her, but... When he says there, what have I to do with thee? He is showing to her that whatever physical relationship there is between them, that's where it stops. That as far as the work that he came to do, and, and today we live in a generation where people want to exalt Mary above measure. I've even heard it said that the reason why there are those that pray to Mary or address their words to Mary is because she's got a softer touch than, than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he needs that, that woman's touch to get the ear of sinners. Well, that's nothing but idolatry. And there is but one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And so there is no relationship, no earthly relationship that is ever to be put above our Lord Jesus Christ. As a woman, Mary was nothing but a frail, needy sinner herself. She was not without sin. That's why when it was revealed to her that through her womb would come this one who is the Savior, she acknowledged that it was her need as great as any others that he be her Savior. And so here again is where that relationship stops. When it comes to the matter of worship, when it comes to the matter of glory, when it comes to the matter of honor, when it comes to the matter of praise, 
Mary has to take her place right along any other sinner and that the Lord Jesus Christ alone be glorified. And so that's what the Lord is reminding her here of. What do I have to do with thee? There is nobody, whether it is Mary that is put in that position of intercession or as many today worship what they call the saints, that there are intercessors beside the Lord Jesus Christ that they look to. Well, they do so to their own peril because there's only one advocate, there's only one mediator who has ever been appointed by God the Father, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Mary is not that advocate. Saints are not that advocate. Our good works are not that advocate. It's not our will that is that advocate. It's Christ alone. And that's how we see him here as sovereign, according to his purpose, according to his will. When he says here in verse four to her, mine hour is not yet come. What he's saying there is that he alone determines how it is and where it is and when it is that he will manifest himself. We could say that his hour was not yet come because everything that the Lord did was according to the predetermining of God the Father. When Christ spoke to the Pharisees, he said, My Father worketh till now, and I work. As he was the anointed of the Father, he's called the servant of God. It's like a, a faithful servant would not say or do anything apart from receiving those orders from his master. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. Everything Christ did and that was done to him and by him and for him had its hour, had its fixed time. And it would be the Lord who would determine that. When he said, mine hour has not yet come, you might think, well, he's speaking of his death. Well, that was part of it. It was at that hour when they came to arrest our Lord Jesus Christ in the garden that he said, now is your hour. This is the hour of darkness. And that's why he was taken. It's not because his enemies overtook him, but he submitted to the will of his father even at the hour of his death. It had to be accomplished exactly when God had purposed it. That's why he's the Passover lamb. It was on the eve of the Passover that he was slain at that hour. And even here, when he speaks of his hour, it says here that he wrought this miracle. So you might say, well, he said my hour has not yet come, but he didn't really mean, no. Even down to the seconds, here she was looking to him to do something. And we know this even in prayer. <laughs> How many times have you prayed? The Lord has put the thought in your heart and you cried unto the Lord and then he's answered that prayer. I think of Daniel when it said, while he was yet praying, the Lord sent a messenger to him. Well, was it Daniel's praying that caused that? No. It was the Lord directing his thoughts to God at that particular time and then answering it according to his will. So when we see the Lord answer immediately, it's not, we can't fall back and think, oh, it's because I was praying. And there it is all of a sudden. No, it's that the Lord put the request in your heart and mind. You addressed it to him at that hour when God had so purposed that it should be answered. I believe that's the sense here when he said to her, my hour has not yet come. Another way of saying that is that it would be determined according to his will, not ours. And so even as the Lord put that desire in her, in verse 3, when she said they have no wine, she did turn to the right person. She didn't run in frustration here all around. Well, let's see what we can do getting busy. She turned to the one that the Lord directed that her heart should turn to, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So even in that, 
It was the Lord directing. And as he said to her, my hour has not yet come. You notice what she says in verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. You talk about submitting to the will of God. She didn't even know how it was he was going to manifest his glory and power. She just knew that it would be according to his will. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. This is another way, you know, when people address us and say, well, we need to be in prayer. We need to pray for this. We need to pray for that. You know that it's when people are in need that they tend to cry out to God. I think about how in the desert that the Lord created the need and then produced the cry on the part of the people. When they were thirsty, what did the Lord say to Moses? Go and strike the rock. And the water came forth. It was out of need. And I'll tell you, unless the Lord creates in us the need that he intervened, we would never cry out to him. But here was a moment of need. And just like the Lord taught his disciples to pray, thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. What she says here to these servants, and she gets out of the way. We don't see Mary here as being the mediator. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Even that statement alone is an indication that Mary's heart even though the physical mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, yet she was in complete submission to his will. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's the way it's always going to be. She did not pretend to have any influence on him that he should act on her behalf. That because she had made the request as, as his mother, physical mother that somehow then he would follow her lead or, or her guidance. No. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And here's where we see then the unfolding of his purpose. How it was that he purposed all along to manifest his glory. It says here that there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two and three firkins apiece, gallons, is what another way of, of looking at that. So here were some water pots made of stone, and the original purpose of these water pots was, as it says here, for purifying of the Jews. In other words, this water was for washing and for religious purposes, if you will, according to the law. But here's where we begin to see the significance of what our Lord is doing here. When he takes these otherwise dead stones, just think back of how the scriptures refer to the law as being commandments written on tablets of stone that everything that pertained to the Old Testament law, here the Lord was taking, and when we think of stone, there's no life in it. And our Lord is, what he's showing here through this particular miracle is there's about to be a change. That whatever is part of that old economy, and as Paul wrote about it, a ministry of condemnation, that all of the following of that law by those that were under the law could not produce life. We notice here that the Lord didn't take something that was already of some significance and making it better. Here we see our Lord taking six water pots of stone, and some make a point of that number six in Scripture referring to man who was created on the sixth day, but in and of itself dead. I mean, these are water pots that had no life in them. And if they had just taken and poured water into it, it might have sufficed as far as quenching some thirst temporarily.
But here our Lord Jesus Christ is about to take what is dead. That's what, what we're seeing here, made of stone, and which was after the manner of purifying of the Jews, used for, as the law was, all of those types and pictures where, as the writer to the Hebrews said, could only serve for the purifying of the flesh, but it could not give life. And that's where our Lord in verse 7 said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. The brim. I find it interesting that when you go back to the first of the miracles that Moses performed when he went before Pharaoh was the turning of water into blood. So Water, which typifies life, turned into blood, which represents death. Here's where now we see a connection that the beginning of Christ's miracles was turning water into wine. And what we're seeing here is the beginning of something new. That whereas the law typified, the law of Moses typified deadness. In other words, it could not give life, but Christ coming and fulfilling the law is where life is. There's no life in that law. Man's best efforts at keeping that law can only end up in condemnation. Had not Christ intervened here, there would have been nothing that could have benefited those in need. And so we see here that the curse of the law, the curse of, of sin, the deadness represented in the water pots of stone. Christ speaks in the Old Testament of taking hearts of stone and making them hearts of flesh. In other words, that feel, that are sensible. There's life in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ is represented here and is representing in this miracle. This is why this is a wedding to remember. It's not just about turning water into wine. Everybody going, wow. I remember doing those little chemistry experiments back in school where you would have just some water in a tube and you add this little element and that and all of a sudden it turns red. And we're like, whoa. That's not the purpose of our Lord doing this. But just like anything he did, was to demonstrate who he is and the blessing of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Lord said that to the Pharisees. You can't take new wine and put it in old wineskins. You can't marry the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ to traditions and the laws that we find under the law. It's not Christ plus whatever you can do to fulfill the law. No, it's Christ alone. And the Lord's going to demonstrate, He, even as here, brought these to a point where there was no hope. There would be no wine. They lacked the wine. And some say, well, couldn't Christ have just spoken the word and increased the wine just like he blessed the bread and multiplied it? Well, there's a lesson to be made here concerning his person and work. Not only in verse 7, filling the water pots with water. Here's where we need to see that this is a demonstration of who Christ is as the water of life. And when it says fill it to the brim, when he takes and puts that in these water pots of stone, I see that those water pots of stone that were set aside for physical purifying of the Jews him filling it to the brim speaks of Christ fulfilling that law completely. To the brim means you can't add anything more to it. It's to the brim. And then, after that was done, it says in verse 8, He saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. Now here's a question. Was that water turned into wine? in those water pots 
of stone, of deadness? Or was it turned into wine as they took it to the governor of the feast to bear it? I believe it was when the water pot was filled with water was simultaneous, that this water then was turned into wine. Just like with regard to the work of Christ that he came to accomplish. Once that water was filled to the brim, in other words, once Christ had fulfilled all that was written of him in the law, filling the water pots to the brim, right on up to his death at the cross. When he said, it is finished, that was the water being filled to the brim. And then what did he do? He commended his spirit unto his father. And when they came and found our Lord Jesus, no man took his life. When they came and found our Lord Jesus Christ already dead and they pierced that spear into his side, what came forth in John chapter 19? Look at it with me. John 19. It was simultaneous with the water being filled with the brim, so then the water turned to wine. When Christ had finished the work and all that he is is the water of life, and his person, his complete obedience to the satisfaction of God the Father with regard to those Old Testament types and pictures, dead stones, and yet now he the water of life. When it says here that in John chapter 19, in verse 33, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. This wasn't these people running the show because as you see there, a little later on in verse 36, these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Picture again the water filling up these stones to the to the brim, Christ fulfilling. There's not one part of that law or prophecy or type or picture that he had not accomplished. But according to scripture, a bone of him shall not be broken. But what do we read when it says they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. They would break the legs of these that were crucified to keep them from pushing up and getting breath. It was a way of suffocating them. But even as Christ said, no man takes my life. I give it of myself such as the commandment that I've received of the Father. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now that's not without significance, because here's the water of life. They crucified the Prince of Glory, and yet mingled with that life that flowed out of him unto death was that blood. It was necessary that it not only be his life in fulfillment of the law, but his death. Both were necessary. And when Bob was reading over here in 1 John chapter 5, and there's a lot that we could say about this, but I believe this is the significance of what took place here. The Lord, by this first miracle, the miracle of miracles at this wedding, to be remembered, was demonstrating how it is that he, the water of life, should give his life represented in the blood. And that's how John represented. This is the same John who's writing here this gospel over here in 1 John, where it says, this is he that came by water and blood. There's a lot of discussion. Well, how did he come by water? Well, to Nicodemus, he spoke of natural birth and compared it to spiritual birth. How's a baby born? Well, the baby, there's, it's in water, and when that water breaks, the, the child comes forth. So some see this here as referring then to his birth by water, but not just his birth, but his death. So it took Christ coming in the flesh by water, but also for the purpose of laying down his life. Some see that also as a demonstration of his baptism, that these two things manifest who he was at his baptism, 
it was declared, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So some say, well, this is what John was speaking of, of his baptism, whereby he was anointed as that high priest at the age of 30, just like the priests were. So that speaks of his baptism, which was symbolic of his work, immersion, speaking of his death, burial, and resurrection, and then his blood. But even Jesus Christ, not by water only, so if it's speaking of his coming into this world, it wasn't to be accomplished simply by his coming into this world and living his perfect life and, and then going back to glory. No, not by water only, but by water and blood. And he had to come into this world as a man and lay down his life. And it says there, it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is true. Now beware of having a translation of scripture. Modern translations take verse 7 out completely because it's the clearest demonstration of the Trinity who God is, Father, Son, and Spirit, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. So the Spirit is the one who reveals the Lord Jesus Christ, but he does it through the water. I don't think of that as being baptism, your own physical baptism, but in the context of his coming in the flesh and the blood. His coming in the flesh and his dying, all which are testified by the Spirit, and these three agree in one. And if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. So coming back here to our text, I believe this is the reason why the Lord perform this first miracle and why it's called there in verse 11 the beginning of miracles that word beginning can mean the the chief of all miracles and what it typifies and testifies and when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Even here we see a picture of how God has been pleased to do his work of salvation, where the beginning in types and pictures and prophecies is not to be compared to the latter, which is Christ, the fulfillment. Paul spoke of it in 1 Corinthians 15, first the natural, then the spiritual. And so this is how this master of ceremonies, if you will, was reasoning. Well, why wasn't the good wine brought first, and then when that is run out, then you bring the weaker? People reason that way. Why all those thousands of years was not Christ manifest in the flesh? Why, beginning there in the garden, did God not immediately manifest Christ in the flesh? Well, his purpose was that even as here, the people tired of the weaker wine first. It had to be manifest that given the best of situations and the law and everything that pertained to it, that it would always come up wanting. It would always come up lacking. There's no salvation in the title. I've got a picture on my office wall of a loaf of bread sitting on a table. Well, as beautiful as that picture looks, that bread cannot give life. If I'm in need and hungering, I look at that bread all day long, and it's not going to satisfy the hunger. That's by these water pots of stone. They were set aside. They were sitting there, used for other purposes. But it took the Lord to take those now and to make of that water, which represented him as the giver of life, 
wine, which represented his death. And that's how the good wine was kept until now. That as we study the New Testament, oh, it's like the writer of the Hebrews said concerning the law, it was a shadow of good things to come. <laughs> what a blessed truth that we have in studying the scriptures now to be on this side of all of that. Those of the Old Testament look forward to. The Lord gave them his spirit to see how the fulfillment was yet to come. Job spoke of that. And he's to be the oldest of all the writers of scripture, even before Abraham. But God gave him eyes to see even through his suffering. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And in that day shall stand upon this earth. He's talking about Christ coming in the flesh. Given that hope. All of those that died, the writer of the Hebrews says there in Hebrews 11, they died without having received the promise. The promise. It was the promise. That's this good wine. And it was manifest when it pleased Christ to do so as a type and picture of that work for which he came. And so much more here than what we certainly can cover, but I pray that as we've looked at this together, we see the glory of Christ in all of it. And the Lord continues to teach us. We see more and more his glory even in these miracles. All right.